What's going on, everybody, and welcome to the Ask SSP podcast. So this is a complimentary podcast to the other side of the firewall, where we talk about the latest and greatest in cybersecurity news, as well as we highlight those movers and shakers and glass ceiling breakers, those people of color who made it to the other side of the proverbial firewall. My name, my name is Ryan Williams. I cannot speak. So with me today is Alan Wesley. He is a CSM, a CISP. He holds an MBA, uh, as well as he is a DE and I champion uh, within the field. So I wanted you to kind of break down who you are, uh, what brought you into uh, cybersecurity, so your cybersecurity origin story, and then we can kind of talk about what you currently do. So without mm -hmm. further ado, I'll give it to you. Thanks a lot. I appreciate that, Ryan, and I appreciate you for bringing me on, giving me the opportunity to, um, to you know, have this discussion. Um, so yeah, my name is Alan Wesley. I'm a, I'm a director of cyber intelligence. Now I'm doing strategy uh, as a um, as an individual contributor. So it's interesting uh, moving between those two roles, but um, I've been doing that across three different um, <clears throat> across three different defense contractors for the past. Oh, I don't know, um, fifteen years. And prior to that, I was an IT manager. Um, so I worked with technology then uh, at Boeing company. And then, um, and that is actually where I, I, um, I ended up in the cybersecurity, but going way back to talk about, you know, my entire path is I, I've had lots of jobs, right? I've been a janitor when I was really, really young, just cleaning up cigarette ashes and, 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 and cigarette butts in, um, in, uh, in the sweatshops and phone shops, uh, call centers all the way up through um, when I went into the military, um, even as a even as a uh, as a ground pounder, so to speak, as a grunt, I ended up in the back of a PLL trailer controlling the whole computerized inventory uh, inventory of uh, equipment that was deployed down range because I was the only one that knew how to use the laptop or the one, only one that had an interest in using the laptop right. so that, <laughs> that became my role. So that's you know that's how I ended up you know kind of working with computers. Um, how I ended up on this uh, role where I am now is—it's like you said when we were in the in the pre-recording here. It's it's a crooked road. Road. Everybody's path is different. You know, um, I when I was in high school, I thought I was going to be a musician, right? I studied music, uh, played piano, vocal music. I thought I was going to be an entertainer, right? And I was going to school in um, Seattle, Washington at the time, and all of my friends who were in music and doing those types of things ended up in computers. Most of them started working over at Microsoft, obviously, in, uh, in Seattle, where the headquarters is, and everyone else went off to different places. And everybody that I, when I, you know, I'm in touch with some of my uh, alumni folks, and they're all in, working in computers, right? So it's that, you know, there's a, there's a tie between um, music, I think, and and, uh, I was going to say that's pretty interesting. And so, do you think it was proximity, or do you believe that there is a bridge between music and uh, infrastructure technology? Like maybe because of how much uh, you know, sound boards and lighting and things of that nature, like AV. Yeah, I think there's a there's a connection, right? You know, I've always I've known I've learned about myself over time that one of the things that people were taking for granted for me or just tapping into, and I didn't know it, they were just taking advantage of the fact that. I don't like chaos, right? And so when I'm in a chaotic situation, I I start looking for patterns, right? And I look for those patterns and I take those patterns, uh, this is repeatable. So let's make a process. So my chaos becomes, you know, um, sanity. And so a lot of employees that I work for, they saw that and they, you know, even when I was working in a warehouse at Ace, I was working in a warehouse, literally, Ryan, I was throwing totes onto went to pallets and sending over shipping and receiving. And then I actually go, went into the shipping office and I looked around, we had just opened the place up. Uh, the office was brand new um, and they were struggling with trying to figure out how to quantify how many totes they were stacking up and say, I, I went in there, I created a, a, an Excel spreadsheet and I mirrored the whole docking system. And I was able to, you know, we did a lot of barcode scanning, get it out, automated. Right. And so that got me off of the sort line because they actually took that as a process and they, they actually used it for several years after I left. That's interesting. So you're already into automation and, and orchestration even back then. 
before those things were yeah before those things were were big uh as they are now so no that's very interesting so and you did say something that i found interesting like you said in the pre-recording where you said you went from tanks to satellites to uh information technology so can you kind of break down your your path in the military yeah so um when i was in the army uh, like i said i was um I was a PLO clerk, prescribed load list uh, clerk, and so it was my responsibility to um, to keep inventory of all of the parts and equipment for the uh, for the vehicles, the track vehicles that we were using downrange, and so that kind of you know uh, spilled over into when I went uh, when I left the um, the army, I went into the Air Force Reserve. And I was trying to figure out which career field to go into. And they said, well, you know, you could be a satellite operator. I'm like, what? <laughs> I don't know anything about orbital mechanics. And so, so they took me and they put me into um, satellite operator training. And they, you know, they, they pretty much jammed orbital mechanics into my head. Fundamental stuff, right? No orbital planes and, you know, you know how many uh, degrees they're inclined to each other. All of this uh, stuff that I, I was completely oblivious to, but I actually took to it because fundamentally a lot of the stuff that was happening in the background was done with Excel spreadsheets and, and doing command plans, so on and so forth. So they kind of stitched together. Got you. Okay. And then uh, your, your path kind of led you into, uh, I, I see that you're an adjunct professor as well. And then uh, obviously you've been in the defense contracting space for some time now. So mm -hmm. uh, obviously, the, you know, those steps from the military into the uh, defense industrial base, um, it's not a far, you know, uh, reach. And I, I see that you're doing, uh, you know, big things in that space. So what, uh, I, I would say, what what keeps you within uh, defense contracting? Um, what 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 uh, what drives you to stay within this space? Because I, I have my own. Uh, like I tried to get away from the military as far as possible, right? I just retired and I was like, you know what? I'm never going back. Like I, I enjoyed mm -hmm. it. It was a great part of my life. I spent over half my life in it, uh, but I want to do something in the private sector. And you then I went out you there. You retire? I did. I, so I, I did oh. my 20 uh, okay. back in April. So 20, okay. 20 years, six days. <laughs> Thank you for your service. Thank you. For your Thank service. you. I appreciate it. Same, same to you. <laughs> but uh, uh, what I did miss when I was there, right? So like the uh, Corporate space is, is is amazing. Like uh, I I met some really good mentors. I met some really good colleagues. I missed the mission. So is that kind of what brings you, uh, yeah, it is. Like, or keeps you in orbit, so to speak? No pun intended. Uh, within well, it is. You're, you're right. I mean, you know, I got out of the military as a product of they kept chasing me for my weight, right? And I just felt like I didn't <laughs> I didn't want to keep having to pass the PT test all the time right so I, I didn't retire I actually I left before I left the Air Force before then but to your point mission was the thing right I wanted to see how can I can how can I still support a mission how can I still contribute to the military aspect of things without actually being in the military and defense contracting was a natural flow they taught me how to do orbital mechanics they taught me how to run um, ground control systems I ran a team um, uh, once I got out of the military, out of, out of the service, I came on as a defense contractor and I learned all about um, running an ops center, mission, uh, mission ops center. Uh, we did a primary mission ops center in uh, Shriver Air Force Base before it became Shriver Space Force Base. And then we had a backup in Vandenberg. And, right, and so we did transfer of operations. I had a huge team of about 50 people consisting of managers and then um, uh, uh, technicians, you know, um, ISSOs, we system administrators, we had um, data analysts, just a whole array of people. So I learned a lot. Uh, that was eight years well spent in the um, in the um, airport Air Force uh, GPS program. No, that's that's awesome, um, especially um, when it comes to kind of where our country is going to pivot um, when it, when we go into um, the AI and the data. Uh, management uh, portion, but uh, what I found interesting is GPS, right? So we kind of take it for granted. Uh, can you kind of break down, um, like, so I know of, uh, I think it's Tick and Talk, like, mm -hmm. so I know a little bit uh, just from my my networking experience, right? That's where we grabbed our timing from typically, right? So your NTP mm -hmm. came from those systems. So can you kind of break down why, why that's so important, um, uh, yeah. the, the Air Force mission for it? 
It is important because they call it a civil service, but you know, it does a lot more than just civil service. There's different things on a payload, right? I, I found out all that first time working there. But way back in the day when I was in the, in the army, uh, we used to have these pluggers and these things were huge. They were just like bricks. This was our first GPS system. Like we have our phone now and tell us where we're going to go. Right. These were, these were purpose built devices that, um, that, that you would find your positioning on. And I remember being in my track vehicle with my track commander above me, and uh, we're trying to find our, our um, coordinates, right? And so and we had, to, we had to have four satellites to be able to triangulate and find out where we were for, for positioning. And what I didn't know at the time was um, the satellites above and below the horizon and how many you have above the horizon and how much precision you can get depending on how many satellites you had in view. Um, my track commander was telling me, Wesley, I I'm losing, I'm losing GPS. Drive over the hill there. And so, I, I, in the moment, I'm like, I'm driving, trying to get this signal. And then fast forward, where I was a satellite operator, and I have to understood how satellites and how GPS works. I was like, I could have drove all day, and I would have never. Right. <laughs> no satellite <laughs> view. <laughs> But you know that's that's just the dynamic of being on the battlefield, and then actually being behind the technology. And that's the thing that that I've, I'm really passionate about because what we do as defense contractors, there are people on the ground who don't understand the technology. They just need to have that service. They need to have that capability. They're not really concerned about how it works. And for me, that's a driver. That's you know I understand the importance of what we do. No, uh, absolutely. And and I think a lot of people take it for granted, just that comm in general. Um, so when I uh, was stationed here in, in Florida, I worked for the Joint Communication Support Element. Uh, so we do a lot of tactical work with um, uh, three-letter agencies, the task force, things of that nature. I'm a switch and router guy by trade, but they make you a broader communicator, right? Like you learn SATCOM, you learn radios. Uh, and yeah, SATCOM blew my mind. Like the, just the stuff we could do uh, when it came to... Um, transporting data uh, and is just trying to figure out like so we had lock, uh, Hawkeye Light 3s we had 2.4s things of that nature just learning how that worked I, I got a, a pretty good um, uh, appreciation for SATCOM uh, operators uh, and, and communicators throughout all the services right mm -hmm. uh, so yeah working with Harris and L3 and all that good stuff so definitely like uh, learning, like you said, how low orbit works. I was just like mind blown, right? So I don't, I'm just getting a taste of it. It's not my career. It's just, I had to know enough to be able to set up the, you know, sat -com communication equipment right, right. Uh -huh. to be able to transport, you know, my, my data. So yeah, uh, uh, amazing stuff. Um, so when it comes to your um, adjunct uh, as, as a professor, uh, what, what do you teach? So I teach cybersecurity. And what's interesting is I teach cybersecurity to foreign students, most of them from India. And uh, the classes are, are in person, right, uh, in Orlando, and some of them are online. And what I find interesting about that is it teaches you a level of patience, right? Because uh, English is not, you know, the, the dialect is hard. The, their accent is hard to understand. But with some patience, you know, it, it's, not that, it's, not, it's not difficult, especially when you start uh, talking about cybersecurity and make it in terms of things that people can understand, right? For instance, you know, um, the difference between, you know, um, or the reason why I advocate for people, if you're working at an organization, especially if you're working at a defense organization and you deal sometimes with classified information to carry two devices, the one that the employer gives you and then your own, because, a lesson learned is if you get a data spill and it gets on your personal device and if the customer says it's severe enough, right. they have the authority to tell you to destroy that device. And I just made a choice. I said, I am not going to crush up my $1,200 phone. <laughs> so I carry, I carry a work device. And so if something needs to be wiped, you know, they can tell me you know, destroy it or they can do a, a, a wipe on it, whatever they want to do, it's not mine. And I don't have any personal information on it. Right. No, I, I, absolutely. So yeah, I've I've dealt with classified uh, uh, message spillage, right? CMS cases. So you're like, yeah, we need to contact Yahoo and let them know. <laughs> right. But, but making those, that's the thing when teaching, right? Is is making, uh, telling stories, number one. And number two is making it relatable, right? In real time, you know, asking things like, 
one of the things I really I find in, uh, insightful is when I ask my students is how many apps do you have on your phone? You know, and people, you can see the puzzle look on their face and then they, some people go 80, 90, 120. You know, yeah, it's, it's possible to have over 100 apps on your phone. And the next question I ask is, how many of those privacy statements have you actually read when you were downloading oh, those apps? Zero. <laughs> <laughs> zero. <laughs> Yeah, that's very true. Like, yeah, this this uh, calculator app wants to use your camera. You're like, wait a minute, what? This... <laughs> Why is it in my camera? <laughs> makes no sense. But no, that, that that's awesome. And yeah, uh, I, I I absolutely understand the uh, the aspect of patience. Like, so I, I did a little bit of uh, of teaching, but not to foreign students, right? It was to blue suitors, green suitors. Um, uh, who? How were... was it? Uh, really good, actually. So I, I did it in Turkey, right? So I worked for UMGC, and uh, most of these students were trying to complete their CCAF. So it's a lot of intro classes. So I never really got to teach, like the like not to say that like, it's not the good stuff. Like yes, it, every class is the good stuff, uh, but I never um, was able to go past some of the intro classes because that's what they needed to pass their CCAF, right? So like, I couldn't mm -hmm. really get into their bachelor's or master's courses, even though I was qualified for it. Uh, so the, the most I ever got was Psych Plus, Net Plus type boot camps, which I, I thoroughly enjoyed. But then when you have psychology majors, like not to knock that, my undergrad is psychology, my, my master's being a cyber. Because um, I was thinking about pivoting and I didn't. <laughs> I was like, you know what, I'm going to stay over here. Um, but to see the light bulb go off, that was my favorite part. To see where you can, like you said, break something down and make it practical. And they're like, because they, they're always, they seem intimidated by technology. But mm -hmm. like, you have a smart, you have a, one of the world's smartest computers in your pocket. Like you, you have this, <laughs> you get it. You just I don't feel comfortable or confident in yourself um, to, um, uh, to, you know, have that swag when it comes to talking about networking and things of that nature. But once you get to the end of the course, you had like, like I said, psychology majors or mm -hmm. uh, infantry guys and stuff like that, like able to break down signal flow. And you're like, yeah, you got it. Like you can do this. So that's awesome to see. Uh, you know, we have that, that uh, in common. I have not taught since I got back in the States. It's, very hard <laughs> to get, it's hard. It is get hard. back in yeah it's hard well it's hard when you have a full-time job too right it's hard yes. teaching twice two nights a week from um from five until nine at night and then you know you have the day job on top of it but in that case you're doing it because you want to not because i wasn't right. because i had to <laughs> <laughs> right, right. Passion. So one day I'll go back into it. I, right now I'm just trying to retire for a little bit, right? Do my <laughs> job, go you know, hang out with the kids. Uh, but yeah, one, one day I'm going to get back on, on the, uh, the horse, so to speak. Um, so when it comes to uh, initiatives, so I also saw we had in common uh, the DEI aspect of it. So I, I, we kind of started getting some conversation, but I, like, like I always tell people, I don't want to burn too much material when I had that conversation uh, on the podcast. So when I initially started the podcast was uh, during COVID. So uh, I was going crazy, right? I, I just arrived in Turkey, uh, like at the first year, like 2020 of, the, of, of COVID, and they were more locked down than states were, surprisingly. Right. Or not surprisingly, depending upon your your perspective. Um, so it was like, go to your hotel room, do not pass go. Uh, you're going to be here for two weeks. Go straight from the PAX wow. terminal <laughs> to your hotel room. <laughs> Someone will bring you food, hopefully. I wish they did. Um, <laughs> like, that's so like that, prison. <laughs> yeah, basically. Uh, so, so that's when I started. I had the idea in my head to do the podcast. I said, well, I have nothing but time to research and to start it. Uh, and then during that time, I was very um, intrigued with the transition, right? I was, I'm not sure if I'm going to get out the military or not. Uh, I have another two, two and a half years. Um, and when I talked to my coworkers, a lot of them were saying like, hey, in the military, it is a melting pot, believe it or not. When you come out here, it is not that. <laughs> <laughs> it's very one type of person here in cyber and, and IT. Um, and that kind of lit the flame, right? Like, okay, I want to build my network. I want to make it as big as possible. And I want to help other people in this transition as well. Uh, because I didn't, I didn't know how good I had it. Right. Cause, uh, uh, especially being joint, uh, when I was with the joint communication support element, you had people from all walks of life, all services, all races, everything. Um, mm -hmm. and then to find out that it's not the case on the outside where the stats were, we only make up 7% of cybersecurity, right? We only have like two or 3% who are in those senior and senior, uh, senior, and senior suite positions. Mm -hmm. uh, it's just a very small group of people. Um, 
so hey i need to branch out i need to to do this and i saw a lot of other people were starting to, to, to start that initiative as well so it's good to see that you still have that initiative it's good to still see people still doing it because what i found mm -hmm. after the pandemic was a lot of that was going flat it was like hey we need to make these record making profits and this is something we need to cut and that's very disheartening uh, mm -hmm. So again, thank you for for being a DEI champion, because uh, there's not many of us able to do that right now, especially in this uh, this climate. Yeah, you're right. Um, I, I was I'm the um, I'm the former chair for uh, what we were what we called at Elder Harris Elder Harris Employees of African Descent. I did a two year stint as the chair. I just transitioned out of it at uh, the beginning of this year. We have a new chair. But when I was in there for those two years, that was, you know, mentoring. And um, and it, you never know, Ryan, when people, how people view you or when they're watching you. I mean, literally, I would be traveling through the airport. Not that I'm famous, but, you know, you you pass people, right? And and they've been on they've been on a call that you were on. And there's like 100 people on the call. And you were giving some kind of a talk as a chair. And then they see you. And I'm like, you're, I'm like, I had to stop. I'm like, you know, am I dressed okay? And, you know, did I say something? Did they hear me say something bad? Because you start thinking about <laughs> right. that. Right? But the, the other side of that is, is even if you don't want to be, you become a remote, a role model. I'm sure you've seen the same thing, right? right. And mentoring folks, right? I, I, I absolutely believe in mentoring, especially uh, our young men. I was at the Nesby conference and, you know, there was a gentleman walking by. He was, um, that's the National Society of Black uh, Engineers. Um, and uh, he was going to, uh, he was going to one of the briefings and he had a suit on, right? And he was about, I guess, 20 years old, 20 years old. And, you know, when you buy a suit, Ryan, a um, men's suit, and you have it double vented and it's stitched down, right. you're supposed to take the threads out. And so, you know, I, I told him I wasn't, you know, I didn't pull him aside. It was very discreet. And I says, you know, you might want to take those out, right? Because those are the little bitty, uh, little moments, right? And if you take that suit and go into an interview, people are going to make impressions, right? You're walking away and they're like, well, why does he still have the, the stitches in the back of the right. you know, It's just the small things, right? And um, he was very appreciative of it, right? He said, I, well, I didn't know that. Just, just small things, but you know, mentoring, uh, being a DEI champion, it means a lot in terms of um, uh, saying things and bringing things forward from the members at large, from Lee that um, that needs to go up the chain. Because I sat on the uh, on the DEI council with our CEO, Mr. Chris Kabasic, and he was very much an advocate, and proponent for what we were doing. And um, if we wanted to change something, you know, we want to fly a flag for Juneteenth. We do that. Um, we want to have different events, professional development. We wanna to talk to the board member. We can get a board member onto our um, Zoom and have them speak to our um, to our members at large. So um, L3 Harris does a lot in the, in, the wake of, um, in the wake of all the noise that's happening down here in Florida with you know, critical race theory and burning books and right. things that they're doing here um, that almost seems like we're moving backwards. So much so I had to go and ask our um, our um, talent and acquisition VP, you know, what's our position as an organization with all of this stuff that's going on when it comes to DEI? Are we rolling back because, you know, um, there is, you know, uh, what do you call it? Um, assistance, right, for education, right? They roll that they, they roll that back, right? And so, um, so you ask those questions: What's happening, and are we still committed? To the cause of DE and I, right? And um, and the answer obviously is yes at the corporate level. But the questions I'm getting from the members at large are, you know, uh, can I move to Florida? Is it safe for me? Because we had members all over the U.S., right? Right. Uh, uh, for lead. And um, as their positions change, I had a gentleman ask me. He says, "I'm about thinking about coming from Utah and bringing my family here." And um, is it is it safe? I mean, I hear all the stuff on the news, and you have to kind of dispel all of this. I'm like, yeah, there's plenty of black people living in Florida, and nobody's, you know, uh, you know, they're doing okay, they're doing fine. So um, there's a lot of that. No, no, that's that's good. That's an interesting perspective. So I'm here in Florida as well. So I'm in uh, the Wesley Chapel, so outside of uh, Tampa, um, because this was my my last stateside duty station, and we really we really did really enjoy it here. Um, aside from the, the giant flag, but mm -hmm. <laughs> it's closer to me than it is to you. Um, 
But uh, with that being said, so I, I think that's a, that's a very good segue into the AI conversation. Uh, okay. Because there, there's a lot of uh, ethical uh, ramifications and just talk amongst uh, uh, communities because of the impacts AI can have uh, on groups um, because of who may be working on it, right? So AI bias, ethics, things of that nature. One of the first stories we did was on Dr. Gabriel from Google and uh, kind of the fallout that she had with them uh, when it came to the ethics of AI and how she didn't uh, feel comfortable with where it was going, right? Um, uh, since then, I believe she started her own company. She's championing a bunch of um, initiatives as well to try to um, uh, get the right people in the room when it comes to building uh, these large language models and things of that nature, generative AI. Um, but when we were conversating via LinkedIn, you said you wanted to talk about AI uh, mm -hmm. as well as uh, uh, data in general. So I kind of want to go into that conversation because um, I, I I believe uh, obviously it's the future, right? Like everybody's using Copilot or Bing or mm -hmm. uh, uh, cha uh, Chat GPT or what have you. There are numerous um, uh, AI tools. I, I, I've also seen a lot of companies are scared, right? They, they want to, mm -hmm. how do we protect ourselves? How do we, uh, I, I, I drummed up a memorandum um, of understanding, right? And it's, it's trying to take baby steps like crawl, walk, run. Uh, you don't have AI policy yet, but here's some things you may want to put into um, a memorandum just so people don't feed mm -hmm. the, the large language model, your PII and things of that nature, right? Um, so it's just kind of uh, kind of talk us through what you're doing in that space and, and kind of um, your thoughts. So that's interesting, Ryan, because I'm a I'm a tech junkie, right? Number one, I'm an early adopter. Number two, I, I like to I like to try new technology, which is kind of strange because I'm 57 years old. I say that on <laughs> on this recording, but um, I've been dealing with technology a long time. And um, my, my ethos is, is you can't hide from technology, right? You cannot hide in a bunker and think that you, you're safe, right? If you're living in this world, right, in our society, you are partaking in the technology. You, you have to. There's cameras everywhere, right? You can't drink from a water without a fountain without your mouth wet, right? So you can't say, I'm going to take all the good things from technology and I'm going to hide myself so I'm not impacted by it. That's just impossible. So what I say is embrace it, um, and I'll, I'll actually, you know, talk about you know teaching. You know, I right when I was teaching my second class, that's when the whole ChatGPT thing broke loose, and all of the administrators, a lot of the administrators where I was teaching, they were like concerned. They're like, "What if my students start using that to write their papers?" I'm like, "Good, good. <laughs> Create some framework for them while they're using it. There's nothing wrong with. I, I use ChatGPT all the time." And I like what you said when you said there are other large language models because every browser like Opera, I don't know if you use Opera, they have a uh, they have a, um, a large language model called Aria, right? You know, okay. Bing, you know, um, Anthropic. There's just tons of them, right. right? So organizations thinking that they can, you know, start shutting off ports to different things so their employees right. can't get to it. I'm like, that's a challenge. I mean, that's just they're gonna find a way. One of the things I liked about L3 Harris was the fact that they took the approach of not blocking it, right? They put up a warning banner, right? When you when you go to ChatGPT, when it first, you know, burst onto the scene, the first thing that L3 Harris did was our, our CIO shop our, um, said, let's put a banner up around it and tell you what the parameters are, right? You click that button that says, I understand these uh, guidelines, kind of like a um, acceptable use uh, blurb that pops right. up. And then you go and it says in there, don't put company proprietary information in there, don't put PII in there, do not put any information into this large language model. This was way back in like way back, right? But in the beginning of January of, uh, of last year, right? When it burst onto the scene and fast forward till today. And now we have our own custom in-house um, large language model. Oh, that's very interesting. It, right. you know, we call it LHX GPT and it's trained on our on our company information, but it's not on the open internet, right? So it's it's internal. So uh, I think people see the value in this, and I absolutely do. I mean, if you follow me on LinkedIn, you'll see I have a virtual avatar. My voice has been cloned. I I can do literally 10 to 20 recordings. All I'm doing is writing in a script. 
I feed it into HeyGen. HeyGen post processes it, and outside the uh, of the other end comes a full production video. And it looks just like me. Like I'm standing here talking to you right now. That's how my avatar looks because it's 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 me. It's just been recorded and processed. And so now I have this template that I can just write scripts, I write the script, and then I can use their public avatars to weave in with my own. And I can have a team of people talking about a topic. You know, it, obviously they can't talk together, but you can hand off from right. one scene to the next scene and then do a closing on it. And it's just, it's a tremendous tool for, uh, for learning. I do learning videos for my um, Cyber Explorer um, uh, LLC that I run now. And it's like, I got all of these employees I don't have to pay for. <laughs> right. <laughs> no, that, that, that is very interesting. Like uh, from, wow. Like, so that, that gives me a bunch of different uh, questions I want to ask, but I don't know if I want the answers to. <laughs> <laughs> So, so I'm still taking baby steps, right? Uh, because I, I am hyper vigilant when it comes to it. Like I know it's the future and I'm very excited about um, the, the implications, especially when it comes to um, just working smarter. However, my, uh, my, my fear is leaning too fast. So what I've been currently doing is I will do um, assistance. I'll write it all up and then I'll feed it um, the, the bits information, um, right. I'll sanitize it. I'll feed it to it. And I want to see, give me a different perspective on this. Give me, uh, as though I'm talking to this type of audience or give this to, or give me a more critical, um, concise approach to this. Here's three paragraphs. Uh, and that is why I've stopped. I have not gone past that just yet. So that's it's more of assistance to. than, than generation. But that's how right. you're supposed to use it, right? And I, I think a lot of people get confused with that, right? I think they, they think it's gonna, you know, I just, I just, it's a genie, right? I ask it a question, it gives me a magic answer. I use it for ideation. I'll, I'll take things and I'll walk through it. I said, oh, well, I have a premise for an article and I want the article to be about this. Go out and do some research and get me some substantial references that support my premise. And then, you know, there's a whole back and forth because I, I, I wrote years before ChatGPT ever happened, I was writing articles, right? So I, I come from a background of having a writing process. And I know the importance that, of how words matter and how words can be used to, um, uh, to evoke emotions, right? And so I use all of that. Plus, you know, we, we had um, English lit when we were in college, both of us, you know, so we know how language works. Right. And the importance of words. And so when I'm sitting down using that tool, I'm using that tool not as a person, you know, looking to, for to give me all the answers. I want to have a dialogue. I want to have do some ideation. You know, I want to test my premise. I want to test my, my theory. I want to test the tone. I want to have it, you know, written in a way if my audience is technical, I want it written technical. If my audience right. is not technical, I want it more relatable. And those are the types of things that you can put into a prompt and you get more, you get more productive output that way than if you just type a one-liner and then you get mad because I see people on, online all the time, chat GPT is dumb. It's garbage in, garbage out. Right. You take your time and you, and you actually use it as a collaborator as opposed to just, you know, a vending machine. You put two nickels in and pull the handle and get your candy bar. It's, it's not like that. No, that, that's, that's very, very well said, actually. So yeah, so I, I guess my process is okay. Oh, yeah. Because <laughs> we're currently you're absolutely, at Absolutely. You need, more people need to think about it like you do, Ryan. It's like, you know, I want to sit down and, and think about this and do some critical thinking as I'm having these interactions and not just trying to, you know, get something for nothing. No, absolutely. And that, that's why I didn't fear it when, because uh, I, I, I was transitioning back to the States as it was starting to become more of a uh, academic um, challenge, right? Where teachers were, you know, afraid that they're going to get generated papers and what have you. So I'd have to deal with that, luckily. Um, but again, like you said, garbage in, garbage out. Like you can tell if it's not a person, especially if you've been with that person for an entire term. You can tell, like, hey, I've, read your stuff <laughs> and this is not in your voice <laughs> like this is that is a that is a good point I mean, and what i did as an experiment um, right as i went back 
14 years ago when I was writing. Uh, and I grabbed up all my articles that I had written before ChatGPT. I put them into PDFs and I fed all those PDFs into, um, into um, ChatGPT. And I said, assess my writing style. Tell me what my weak points are. Tell me what my voice is. And you'd be amazed at the output that you get back. Valuable output, right? It, some of it validates that you think you're with the bee's knees and you were really good. Some of it says, well, now you weren't so good. Your vocabulary needed some work. It stank over here. You could use some... And I get new words that I hadn't used before. And so um, I use it, I use it in a very, in, as a research partner, as a, um, as a, uh, as a ideation partner, where I can- Right, like an actual well. assistant as opposed yeah, to- Yeah, assistant, yeah. that's the word, yeah. I'm saying all these words to say assistant, yeah. <laughs> no, it's great. <laughs> no, we're on, we're on the same page. No, I, I think that's a very interesting perspective. Uh, when it comes to data, so I know you wanted to talk about that as well. Um, so is it from the perspective of management or like where, where, what, where, what's our journey right now when it comes to data? I think people are starting to come to grips with um, data is the core value uh, of their business, right? It used to be, well, um, I make widgets. Well, if you don't have data, you can't make widgets. Right. Data is, you know, that's how you that's how you're defining the widget you want to build. Right. And what's your critical information. Right. And a lot of uh, organizations these days are wrangling with um, uh, what is my critical information. And then when you start looking at the rabbit hole of, you know, remember when I told you about how many people read their privacy statements? I actually um, put a privacy statement into ChatGPT and I said, assess this. And I, and I said, you know, is it, is it good for the user or is it good for the manufacturer, right? What are the clauses in here that protect me? And one of the interesting things I found out about it is that, you know, a lot of these um, uh, privacy statements are, they go off to third and fourth party people and they, they, were, they hand off the responsibility three and four layers deep. And so while you think that, you know, this particular vendor for this piece of software is the person that they're the entity that's responsible, when you start looking at data um, provenance, right, it, there are like three or four layers down that you don't know about. So if something bad happens, right, everybody can pass the buck and they just keep passing the buck and nobody owns the responsibility. So when I talk about data, I, I talk about data inside of an organization, you know, knowing what is your core data, knowing who your third party entities are, and knowing how they're protecting the data and what their privacy statements are. And, and if you have to go three or four layers deep, if your business is that critical or what you're dealing or the data that you're getting from those sources is that critical, you need to be that detailed. And so you need to have some legal eyes involved. Uh, for privacy and for litigation and for liability. And then you need to have your, you know, you need to have your engineers and program managers and your data analysts. It, it just, you know, cybersecurity and data are inextricable. And uh, having those two things um, as functioning parts of the entire organization, it's just imperative. It's just not, it's not, it's not something that you can not do anymore, right? You right. can't say that that's IT's problem. <laughs> You're right, absolutely. And I think you hit the nail right on the head, uh, especially when it comes to uh, vendor management, uh, because the uh, the government's not playing around anymore. Like when we talk about CMMC 2.0 and things of that nature, uh, you're going to have your, your feet held to the fire. Like, are you protecting people's PII? Are you protecting the, the government's classified information? Uh, are you that's protecting the vendor class, cla classified information, uh, UCI mm -hmm. and all that other good stuff? Um, so those things are starting to uh, obviously roll up more on the federal side where they're trying to um, basically uh, hold you accountable. And then with the SEC now holding mm -hmm. CISOs accountable, even though there's still a lot of arguments should a CISO have a seat at the table or not, uh, but they're showing up to all the court dates. So then well, the CISO shows just wait. Should I have a seat at the table? Um, right. But if I'm caught up short, you can certainly fire me. <laughs> right. Like, right, uh, exactly. <laughs> you can't have your cake eat it. So you can't say like, no, I don't have uh, uh, leverage when it comes to the conversation yet. I'll be the one who's going to have to to show up um, to trial. So yeah. there, there's a lot uh, to to unpack there uh, when it comes to, like you said, uh, data, critical data, and then vendor management. Like you, uh, again, 
um i don't read the the uh always like so i i peruse but i i'm just as guilty as anybody else i can't read 90 uh user agreements like the, the only ones i've read oh. are the ones i wrote <laughs> right <laughs> right all right um I, I just found this interesting website um a gentleman uh, stood it up his, i forget his name um i forget his name but he sent me the link, and what it is is that it is a, a database that he's built that's tied to the SEC dis, SEC's disclosure, because every time you, the new rule dropped last uh, last year in December, and it's in effect now for disclosure, you have like four days to disclose. Microsoft just got caught up in a big thing with um, with um, uh, Blizzard, um, and uh, and now I just found out it was released today that another organization. Uh, just got caught up by the same threat actor, nation state actor. Mm. So, um, but these are real time disclosures now. I mean, this literally, it happened today and it got, it made it onto this, um, it made it onto the website because 8Ks are publicly accessible. This isn't information that's hidden. You can go out to, um, to the SEC site and you can go look up your organizations. If you're publicly traded, you can look up your organization and um, you can look for the 10K and the 8K reports. The 8K is where all the disclosure happens now. And so people are actually Got paying it. attention to that. No, that's, 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 I mean, that's good. It's good that it's, it's, it's happening uh, much faster. The adoption of it is much faster than I expected. I was like, no, the, the people are going to drag their feet. The SEC is going to have to take a lot of people to court. But it doesn't seem to be the case. I, I mean, that's, that's good news. But the only danger uh, with that, though, Ryan, is that, You've been doing this for 20 yeah. some years. You know when a cyber attack happens, a ransomware happens, the story is never as good the second time around as it right. is, you know, or the first time around. And they, they run in, they say, "Oh, I had this breach," and you know, maybe it's not that bad. Maybe it's worse, right? You know, you don't know until you right until you assess. Like, yeah, they've done yeah. the investigation, so. So yes, it, it is a double-edged sword. So yeah, I'm, I'm not looking at it from the perspective. I'm, so I'm looking at it from the perspective of a citizen or a client, not as the the uh, cert team. <laughs> really? there's nothing but alarms <laughs> yeah. and screaming happening. So yeah, I, or the PA team, right, uh, mm -hmm. as well. Like there's a, uh, it's rolling downhill uh, at that point. So that, that is very interesting as well. So I, I do have the luxury of not having to be in that seat. Um, so Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. So for those who are listening, they're probably like yelling at their their radio. <laughs> like it's too fast. So yeah, I get I it from both both directions. <laughs> but no, that's very interesting. So uh, I'd be remiss if I didn't ask the question. So because you're you're a wealth of knowledge, this has been a really good conversation. So I definitely have to have you back on the show. Um, what have I not asked you? Like what what a because you you've been on a, a few different. Uh, podcasts uh like like you said off offline you're, you're becoming a season pro over here right so uh I'm gonna book you before you get too busy but what uh, have you <laughs> what have you not been asked or you're like man i wish somebody would ask me this question what do i do for fun and what do i like and I, um okay you know and godzilla movies man i will okay man, i will hurt somebody to go see a godzilla, godzilla <laughs> movie i just i i don't know i'm amazed at how godzilla can tear up japan and then put it all back together in a week right. start over. Because I used to watch it when I was growing up, black and white with my mom. And I was like, oh my God, they rebuilt Japan. He's going to tear it up again. It's like <laughs> Tokyo is going to tear it up. But yeah, I, I just okay. love Godzilla movies. No, that's, that's awesome. So um, have you seen Minus One? Because I haven't seen it yet. I have seen it. Yes. And it was okay. all dubbed. And you would think that <clears throat> because you have to read the bottom of the screen, you wouldn't enjoy it. I, I thoroughly enjoyed it because... The way that uh, the uh, director and producer did it, um, you could enjoy this. You could enjoy the um, special effects, right? But you can still follow the story. Okay, it, it was just done really, really well. And then, wow, Godzilla! I don't know if you've seen. You have said you haven't seen it yet. So I, I, I have not seen it yet. I see some awards. <laughs> it's like the first Godzilla movie to be up for like an either Oscar or something like that. Mm -hmm. like that's that's really crazy. Good. Okay. <laughs> Really so good. I have to I have to check it out because I, I just started Monarch, so I am watching that. I was um, disappointed by Monarch because it's kind of boring. <laughs> I've watched like I've seen three episodes and I haven't seen a monster. Come on. <laughs> yeah, uh, so that's where I stopped at. So that's exactly where I'm at. I just saw uh, what a kaiju like for the mm -hmm. first time. It was tearing up. Uh, it was kind of cool. It was tearing up something they were inside of, so they're trying to escape it. Yeah. Um, and I was just like, man, I don't know if I could do three more episodes for us another one though like know, right? how you how do you make this boring like 
I hear it gets good though. I do hear it gets good. So it's gotten like better. The storyline gets better. I, I, once I put, once I, um, once I've decided that I'm not going to see a monster every five minutes, and I'm actually going to buckle down and listen to the story, then it got better. <laughs> okay. Okay. I have to jump back into it because I'm like, man, this this should be right up my alley. But I'm just like, ah, I don't know. Yeah. Um. So uh, aside from Godzilla movies. Uh, uh, any any books, uh, any any uh, TV shows, anything that's caught your attention recently? So one book that you know, if I want to be high minded, because I'm really when I when I'm at the movies, I'm really shallow. I just want to be entertained. Uh, but if I'm right. being high minded, I would say, the power of um, giving away uh, power is a uh, okay. very very good book. I wish I would have um, brought it over here. I don't want to step away because then I'll break the uh, background. But um, Maybe next time, I'll, if you have me on again, I'll, I'll show you that book. And what, what's unique about that book is that it talks about um, moving away from the pyramid type of hierarchy inside of organizations and more into a constellation of leadership where you have, um, where you have uh, enough room in your leadership circle where you can grow it and expand it with diverse ideas as opposed to having this pyramid where the closer you get to the top, the less room there is. And now you have this group think and you, you know, so it's a very interesting book because it advocates for inclusivity and diversity and thought, cognitive diversity, and a lot of other good um, uh, antidotes and, and uh, ways of thinking about leadership are in that book. So if you have me on again, I'll, I'll have that book. Gotcha. <laughs> I, I will definitely have you back on. Like, uh, no, you've been a, a great guest. Uh, yeah, I, I'm sure there's there's a a lot of there's a lot of rabbit holes we can go down, but I, I think this is a really good uh, conversation, especially for the the first time. Uh, I always tell people I don't like to do a lot of research on the person before I meet with them, which is kind of counterintuitive to to quote unquote journalism. But I'm not a journalist, so <laughs> I would like well, to you know, observe the information. Do all that digging, and it's somebody you don't want to have back on your show. <laughs> 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 well, yeah, I like to, to absorb the information like the audience absorbs it so I can ask those questions that they may also be interested in. Um, but yeah, don't, I'll never be mistaken for a journalist because I come in very flat footed. <laughs> but the good thing, like you say, recorded, right? Like you do a lot of your stuff recorded. The good thing about recording is if you were crazy, I'd be like, well, you know, that was interesting 45 minutes. <laughs> right. <laughs> I can't air. You won't get it back, but yeah. Right. <laughs> well, no, it's been, it's been uh, a pleasure. Definitely have to get you back on. Um, I'll, I'll plug the uh, the show real quick. So uh, we are back Monday through Friday. So Monday, Tuesday, our topics, Wednesday, discussion, Thursdays, Ask Us SP. Uh, so this one will go live, uh, not this Thursday, but the next Thursday. But continuity wise, the audience does not know what Thursday is which. Uh, and then Fridays are everything else, movies, books, games, all that good stuff. Um, so uh, you can find us at the website single by our name. You can hit me up at Rye Rye Security Guy. That's R Y R Y Security Guy. You can find me on LinkedIn, Clubhouse, Twitter, and Threads. Uh, and you, Alan, where can people find you? Oh, yes. Yeah, so you can find me on LinkedIn. Um, I write a lot on Medium. I'm on uh, Substack and uh, I'm on LinkedIn a newsletter. So you can look me up, Alan, Alan Wesley, A L L E N W E S T L E Y. Um, and you can find me at Cyber Explorer as well. But yeah, that's, that's where you can find me. Awesome. And I'll get, grab all those links from you and those will be in the description. So if uh, people did not catch it, they can also click on it. So that's what we'll go for. But yeah, uh, definitely continue to tune in throughout the uh, the week. We'll continue to, to roll the show. Uh, we're still in season two. I'll we'll probably break and do season three uh, fairly shortly. Um, keep keep uh, keeping on and stay safe. Stay scared. Ryan, thank you for having me on the show. I had a blast and um, I look forward to you having me on again. Looking forward to it. Take care. Absolutely. Take care.